first word on the cross, the second, third, and fourth, all deal with persons in different states, in different relationships with Almighty God. The fifth word sums it all up. The fifth word from the cross, our Lord cried out, Sitzio, I thirst. I thirst. You can have a physical thirst. You can have a mental thirst. And you can have a moral, eternal, spiritual thirst. What did he thirst for? The first four words tell us. He thirsted for his enemies to change their hearts. He thirsted for the sinner who was deceived. He thirsted for those he loved and were closest to him. He thirsted for those who were duped by the world, duped by the demonic. In other words, he thirsted for every possible soul that was created by his Father. I thirst. He passes this on to us at the end of the retreat. You must have a divine thirst. The physical thirst tells us that our body needs this moisture. We are told by scientists that almost 84% of the body is water. Two oceans in the body. The freshwater ocean from the neck down. The saltwater ocean from the neck up. In order that each and every one of our bodies might be functioning, we need the water. And so our Lord cries out, I thirst. His body needed water. Certainly, the physical thirst of our Lord Jesus Christ was intense. So much so that he, when they stuck the wine and vinegar, he refused it. He would not give in to the body's thirst even at that moment. He teaches us the mortification of our senses in these words, I thirst. Do not allow the body to become the dominant aspect of your life. The body is meant to be a vehicle to salvation. The body is meant to be used, as St. Francis of Assisi shows us, as body ass, he calls it sometimes, and it must be beaten. Sometimes it must be given what it needs, but it must never, ever assume the priority of our life. The senses in the body are only meant to bring us to an understanding of the truth that God desires to share with us. Because as St. Thomas Aquinas tells us, all things come to us through our senses. The fact that we're hearing good words, the fact that we see the beauty of God's creation, the fact that we hear words and music that can stir our soul, or taste the food that somebody lovingly prepares for us, or touch the hand of another or a leper, and begin to realize in that hand and in that touch is the divine touch of God. I thirst physically to come to know God in and through the body that he has given to me. I thirst mentally, intellectually, because I realize that there is so much that God has created, so much that he wants me to know in order that I might begin to realize and wonder at the spectacle all creation presents to me. If my intellect is thirsty for knowledge, then God opens us to the mystery of his presence in and through all the things that we find in this created order. Nothing is outside the hand of God. That is why I used to say to the young people in the classes of religion, when we sin, we are practicing atheist. We forget the presence of God. That's the only reason. When we sin intellectually, we forget. God can see our thoughts. God knows our thoughts. A young man, football player, intellect, bright star, ready to go on to college, was a writer. He had a dream. And in this dream, he wrote it all down, in this dream he saw a room. And when he went into this room, he saw file cabinets all over the room, file cabinets. He went over and looked at one file cabinet, 
friends I disagreed with. Looked at it. He opened it up and he began to realize every one of these little index cards had an incident in his life perfectly written out. He went to times I did good. Kind words. Evil thoughts. All these different catalogs of things he began to realize as he went through this dream that it was a room filled with all the memories and actions and everything he had done from the very beginning of his life and now he was 17, 18 years of age and look at it all. He couldn't realize how many things there could possibly be in his life. When he started reading them, some of them turned him sick with shame. As he was in the room, all of a sudden another person entered the room. He turned around and he was embarrassed. He said, I saw Jesus Christ. And Jesus came up. And I had all gone through these cards and written my name. This is true. I did it. My name was everywhere on those cards. And he came and opened up one of the card catalogs and he took them. And I was embarrassed. But what did he do? He wrote his name in blood. Over each and everything that I had done, he had written his name in blood. In the end, I looked at him and he did nothing more than embrace me. He had forgiven everything I'd ever done. He wrote out this essay the next day, entitling it The Room. The internet saw it and brought it all over the world. Two days later, he was driving home, went off the road, struck a power pole. He was not killed, but when he got out of the car, he stepped onto a wire and was electrocuted to death. He died leaving this particular work, the room, showing that there is an intellectual desire to come to know everything about ourselves and to realize that God has touched everything with his precious blood. I thirst. As he thirsted, he shed that blood for everything that you and I could ever do within our lives. He thirsted for our souls. He thirsts for us to take up the same cross that he took up. If we have been given graces during this retreat, then the thirst should be in us to come to know more about our Lord Jesus Christ, to read more of his words, and to make it a habit of our life to see things in and through the light of God so that our mental order will be fixed upon the truths of our Lord Jesus Christ. That truth then leads me to the greatest of all thirst, the thirst for an eternal soul. Don Bosco was such a man. On the entrance to his office in the oratory, he had the words written, Da miti a animas cetere tole. Da give miki to me, animas, the soul. Take away the rest, cetere tole. Take away everything else, but give me the soul. And so God gave him this great gift to know when a boy was going to die. It happened one time that a young man was revealed to Don Bosco that this young man, Anthony, he had this name written down for Michael Rua to hold on to, Anthony, Anthony Beccaria, put the name into an envelope and said to his priest, this boy is going to die when I am gone. I want you to make sure you get to him, hear his confession, prepare him well. We'll do it. He said the dream, gave the dream that night, and said, I want every one of you to think that it is you that is going to pass away before this year ends. Father Michael Rua has the name in an envelope so that you know I know but I'm going to be working hard. This boy is going to try to resist me. I will seek him 
And when I am gone, that is when he will die. Well, Don Bosco told him straight. Next day, all boys thought me. There were lines at the confessional, cleaning their hearts and their souls. Don Bosco thought, well, what a great grace that God gives me this opportunity to purify the souls of my boys, prepare them for heaven. But the boy that should be there wasn't there. Playing on the playground, I had not a worry in the world, healthy as can be. Don Bosco came up to him. Anthony, when are you going to come to confession? Tomorrow, Father. I'll be there tomorrow. All right. Then he avoided Don Bosco. Avoided him, avoided him. And Don Bosco had to make a trip at the end of December to go to Paris. He told Don Rua, get after him. I could not get him. I have to go to Paris, but you get after him. He went to Paris. On the Friday, the end of the school, before the Christmas break, all of a sudden the boy came down with a sickness. He was in the infirmary. The doctors told him, you better go home. It'll just get better if you go home and you're with your mom and she'll take care of you with soup and good hot breakfasts and love and so forth. This will pass. It's a flu. He went home. It got worse and worse. And he began crying out for Don Bosco. Don Rua came. He gave him a confession, gave him viaticum, and that Sunday that Don Bosco was supposed to return, that very Sunday, Anthony died. He had called for Don Bosco continuously, just like Don Bosco said he would. And then when Don Bosco got home, he says, Anthony, has he died? He contacted the parents. Yes, Father, he just died this morning. I'll be there. He went to the boy's house and there he said, where is he? In the room. The mother, the aunt, and the daughter went into the room with Don Bosco. The boy was white. The sheets covered him. Don Bosco took off the sheet and cried out, Anthony, Anthony! The boy jerked and looked up. The mother and the aunt Don Bosco, oh, how happy I am to see you. I just had the most terrible dream. What did you dream? I was on the edge of this huge black sulfurous pit. Black smoke coming up. It, heart. It just scared me to no end because arms and hands were coming up at me with nothing more than bones seeking to grab me. And then over to the right, the Immaculate Conception, our Blessed Mother, said, don't touch him. This one is mine. And then you called me. Said Don Bosco said to him, did you make a confession before? Did Michael, Father Michael, hear your confession? Yes, but I didn't tell him everything. I was ashamed. I said, Don Bosco looked at him and said, do you want to make a good confession now? Yes, Father, I do. The mother and the aunt went out. The little boy then made the confession to the priest. Now, Anthony, he said to him, you have a choice. Our Lady is giving you a choice. You can remain here with your family or you can go directly to heaven where you saw Our Lady. Anthony didn't hesitate. I want heaven. And he lay back and he was gone. The mother and the aunt had seen everything. They were amazed that their son or anybody could possibly at the end of their life want to hide something from God. He could have lost his soul. But that's the thirst that Don Bosco had for souls. And that's the gift that God gave to him. A great miraculous gift we would love to have every priest be able to read the hearts and souls of every one of us and, and help us make the confession of our life and then be prepared. We would thirst for that eternity just as Don Bosco thirsted for that eternity for his kids, his boys. 
Each and every one of us has these thirsts, physical, intellectual, and spiritual. We are called to imitate our Lord Jesus Christ who said after he prayed for the enemies whom we probably want to avoid. He prayed for those sinners of which we are the worst. He prayed for his friends, those that loved him most. And he prayed for those who are most deceived, the agnostics, the feminists, the homosexual, each and every one of those who are deceived by sin itself. He prayed for all of them and he thirsted for all of them. It is our privilege to be incorporated into the mystical body of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray those prayers. We repeat over and over again the words of our Lord Jesus Christ because we are with him. If we are in the state of grace, we are with him. And we know that these sentiments that we have that well up within our hearts are the same sentiments that Jesus Christ had when he came to the woman at the well. And he asked her, will you give me a drink? If you but knew who it is that asks you to give him a drink, you would ask him to give you living water, water that would well up from within you and slake your thirst for all eternity. If you but knew the gift of God, the divine well that gives to us the refreshment of truth, the refreshment of forgiveness, the refreshment of true love. If we but knew what God has in store for us, could we not do anything in this world to attain that kingdom? Just think, all the little things that we worry about won't mean a thing when we see what God has prepared for those who love him. Don Bosco had a relationship with those boys that was so unique that when they died, God gave him privileges of seeing those boys, talking to those boys in his dream. One of those boys, most significant, is a saint by the name of Dominic Savio. Dominic Savio came in a dream to Don Bosco and said, you must send your Salesians to do work in England. Dominic Savio cared a great deal about England and the English people. And Don Bosco said, I will. I will send my Salesians to England. But tell me, Dominic, I see you with Francis Busuco. I see you with Mickey Magone. I see you as the brightest is this what we're going to look like in the kingdom of heaven? Beautiful and bright and innocent like you? Oh, Don Bosco, what you're seeing is not a supernatural. You're seeing my preternatural body. What? You know what a natural body is. You can see the natural body with your eyes. But in heaven, if I showed you my supernatural body, you would die. I would die? But I see you so bright and beautiful and this, you call it a preternatural body. Yes, because you could not stand the supernatural body. So God sends you Our Lady or one of the saints and they appear, your guardian angel. They appear in this, what is known as a preternatural. A body that can be seen by the natural people and yet is glorified. Could I but see your supernatural body just for an inkling, just so I might tell people, I might tell the boys what we're really going to look like? It will kill you. It will hurt you. Oh, just a little inkling. Tom Bosco continued to push Don ba Dominic Savio. All right. Look out over the horizon. I'm going to give you a millisecond. Don Bosco says, I was looking out over the horizon and all of a sudden, such an intense light, I woke up screaming. I said, oh my Lord. The intensity of that light, if that was added to the darkness of a soul, 
it would be like a laser burning intensely anything that was not like itself. Then I realized, Don Bosco said, the beauty of a soul, that God would make these souls so beautiful that we would thirst to have our soul cleansed and purified, hence purgatory. And that is why those in hell, they run, they flee from the presence of God because the intense light burns them so badly that they just cannot stay in the presence of God. The presence of God would be hell for them. Worse than hell. I thirst. I thirst that souls may be purified in and through the blood that I am shedding upon this cross and that through this cross souls may be brought back to my Father in heaven. It was recommended in this retreat that we take the opportunity to make the Stations of the Cross with each other. So I thought about that in the last couple hours. And I said, I have done this. I have walked the Stations of the Cross and meditated upon the Stations of the Cross one by one. And then we say a simple little prayer. But we look at what it is that God calls his thirst and how intense that thirst was in ex ex physical expression, its mental expression, and finally, the spiritual expression, the love of a soul. And so, we will do that after we finish the prayers that reflect upon the thirst of the divine. And let us ask Almighty God, as he has given us the saints that reveal to us the beauty of the soul we have within us, think not of your age, Think not of your weakness. Think not of your failings. But think of that beautiful soul that God is purifying in and through his words and his love in this chapel, in this retreat today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs>